Thank you very much for that musical item and for the blessing. And uh, yeah, good morning. Well, good morning. <laughs> it's actually one o'clock, and this says I should be in the lunch cafeteria area at the moment. Yeah, but do you mind if I stay here for a, a little while longer? Um, <clears throat> my um, Pastor Paul, uh, he's uh, he's not going to introduce me, but let me just introduce myself. So. Um, my name is Cedric Vine, and as you can hear from my accent, I'm from the mid-states or uh, mid-states of the USA. Uh, I teach at Andrews at the seminary, and lovely to see another brother here from the states. Uh, but uh, originally, many years ago, I used to live in England, where I worked. I taught at Newbold. We've been in the U.S. for four years now. Before that. I taught at Newbold for eight, and then I was a pastor for nine years in the North England Conference. And um, it's uh, my great privilege and pleasure to, you know, although I haven't been to Scotland many times, I count the British Isles as my home. And you don't know how homesick I was when I moved to America. You know, if they had said, come back in the first six months, if anybody had offered me any job in the UK, I would have jumped on a plane and come home because spiritually I feel as if this is my family. Well, this morning, my message is really to encourage you. Uh, it's lovely worshiping in big numbers, isn't it? Don't you feel it's a real blessing when you hear sort of 100, 200, 300 people praising God? It lifts our spirits. A couple of weeks back, I was in Peru and I worshiped in a church there and uh, you wouldn't be able to guess how many was in the church. 4,000 people. They've built a new church. It went from the outside, it looks like a football stadium uh, at the university there outside Peru. And the place was absolutely packed. Absolutely packed. They have 11,000 students, and that's why they needed to build that, uh, that church. Uh, <clears throat> the church I worship in, and I don't know where you worship, maybe PMC, are you a PMC? -er? So he goes to the big church. I go to one of the small churches at Andrews. Uh, in, in our church, we only have 800 members, 800 to 1,000. It's one of the small churches, and I serve as an elder there. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, when we meet like this, this is, for me, this is my average Sabbath. But when we stand back, you know, we, we are blessed to live in that environment, and there's upside to it, there's also a downside to it. But when you look at our churches globally, the average sized church of an, Adv uh, of an Adventist church around the world in the North American division, and I'm guessing here in the BUC, is about 40 to 50 members. That's the average Adventist church size. And this is what I would like to share with you, is that my title is Saving the City. That's the title of my sermon. And when I look at my title, I think, boy, that is overwhelming. How can average churches of sizes 40 to 50 members save cities or towns or villages that we live in? When we feel so pulled in terms of our resources, how on earth are we going to do that? This morning, I would like to share with you a message from the Gospel of Matthew. Next weekend, I'm going to be at Creef, and uh, I would invite you to come and join us and we're going to have our Bible study weekend uh, on the Gospel of Matthew, looking at the Gospel Commission in context. But this morning, I just want to give you one part of Matthew's theology of mission. And it's really to encourage us that most of us tend to do mission in small groups, often in large cities, where it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. How on earth are we going to save our city for the Lord? Well, this morning I would like to share with you how it is possible in one sense, not in total, I'm just giving a snapshot, and the end result of this is that I want you to go away from our service this morning convicted that, that your role within your cities is absolutely vital from God's point of view. That's the message I want you to take away. Let's bow our heads as we pray before we open God's word. Dear Lord. We thank you for this high day, a day when we can meet together and enjoy common fellowship together with our brothers and sisters throughout Scotland and from the rest of uh, the BUC. 
Now, as we open your word, may it speak to our hungry hearts, Lord. May it water our souls, and may we renew our commitment to be faithful to you. This is our prayer this morning. In your name, amen. So, my message this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. Let's see if this works. And uh, we had in our scripture reading, Matthew chapter 10. And if you've got your Bibles, please find your Bibles. Uh, I teach biblical studies New Testament. And so whatever I do, it's always uh, sort of bathed in my studies. Um, And uh, go with me to chapter 10 of Matthew. And there we have in verse 40 to 42, the conclusion of the chapter. It's the conclusion of a section which is really looking at outreach, at mission. And it's got some very tough things in this chapter. But at the end, the Lord encourages the disciples before he sends them out into the cities of Galilee with these words. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. So you are my envoy. When they open their doors to you, they're not just opening their doors to you, they're opening their doors to me. And whenever they welcome me, when they welcome you, they're not just welcoming me, but they're welcoming the one who sent me, his heavenly father. Whoever welcomes you as in a, a, a prophet in the name of a prophet just means as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes, and this is the part that I want to focus on this morning, A righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And this morning I would like to meditate upon what it means to be a righteous person called to mission. Now generally we don't uh, consider the identity of the Christian as a righteous person. And I would suggest to you that we're actually in a time in our church where holiness needs to be re-emphasized is that in a way, holiness has been put on the the back burner. And this is almost a generational thing. As I study Matthew, I see that there is a call to holiness, but not in order to become legalists working for our own salvation, but rather we become holy in order to save our cities. And let me show you how this works. But before I do this, let's just look at a few texts, because Matthew is steeped in the Old Testament What does it mean to be a righteous person? And for that, we need to go back to our Old Testament, to the Torah, to the prophets, to the writings. And let me just give you a brief snapshot of what it means to be a righteous person. A righteous person, the first righteous person we have uh, is, and these are my three parts to the sermon, which I'd go through if we had a little longer time, but a, a, uh, a righteous person, the first one we have in Scripture is Noah. He's described as a righteous person, perfect in his generation. Now, just think of it. How many were in Noah's family? Noah, his wife, and then he had how many sons? Three sons plus wives. So how many are we looking at? Eight. But you read Genesis 6, and maybe Noah is the more righteous one in his family, I mean, we wonder about some of his sons, but when you compare him with the rest of the inhabitants of the world at that time, how many other righteous persons were there in the world? None. Moses tells us in Genesis 6 that the world was fully corrupt, full of wickedness. Everybody was corrupt. Their hearts were in ter- well, were always inclined towards evil. We simply cannot imagine what a world like that was. And there we had one righteous person and his family tagging along. There is our first righteous person. But it doesn't really help us understand what a righteous person is. If we go to... Let's see if this thing... Uh, We go to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, if you've got your Bibles, flick over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, the debate there is, does God punish the children for the sins of the fathers? Uh, Do we punish the wicked son uh, or the, the righteous son who is the son of a wicked father? And the answer is given... No, God judges you according to who you are, not according to who your parents are. And then he gives us this wonderful description of the righteous person. In Hebrew, it is the Sadiq. 
And turn with me to chapter 18, verse 5, and I'm reading down to verse 9. And I want you to hear this, listening for elements which we will pick up later in the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 5, if a man is righteous and does what is lawful and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift his eyes up to the idols or the house of Israel, so really we're just saying if he keeps his eyes on the Lord and only worships him alone, if he does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her menstrual period, so there we're looking at cultic ritual purity, and now he moves on to areas where he's looking at our relationship to others. If he does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with the garment, does not take advance or accrued interest, withholds his hand from iniquity, executes true, true justice between contending parties, follows my statutes and is careful to observe my ordinances, acting faithfully, such a one is righteous. He shall surely live says the Lord. Now, I hope you were counting how many elements were there. Did you count as I read? Probably not. But if you counted that description of the righteous person, what you actually find is that we have, let's uh, go back one, we have 10 elements. Uh, yeah, there we are, 10 elements. He's giving us three positive elements, three negative, two more positive two more negative. And it's almost like a Decalogue, almost like a Ten Commandments. But not the Ten Commandments as we know, but the Ten Commandments lived out practically in day-to-day -day interaction. The righteous person is someone who knows Torah, who knows the law, but then embeds it in his interpersonal re in relationships with those around them. Deals with justice in business. Deals properly with his spouse is alone a worshipper of Yahweh and no one else. This is a righteous person. We, could, we find the same thing when we go to the Psalms. Uh, <coughs> this thing needs um, a good stiff cup of coffee. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in the Psalms, similar description of the righteous person. We don't have time this morning, but... Uh, take it with me. Read Psalm 15, where again, he gives you 10 items of what a righteous person is, and he's really inviting you to think. A righteous person is someone who knows the law, but not just theoretically, but puts him, it into practice. That is a righteous person. Now, righteous person, the idea of a righteous person rumbled on in Judaism, all the way up from the Old Testament through the intertestamental period up until the time Jesus came to Israel. And uh, they viewed the righteous person as someone who both reflected God's holiness but also reflected his charity and his grace to others. Uh, we read Ezekiel 18. Did you know one of the characteristics of the righteous person is that they give their bread to the hungry and they cover the naked. Now we had this in our Sabbath school this morning and I want you to bear that in mind. A righteous person is not just someone who gives charity to, uh, who keeps the law and is holy but also is someone who gives charity to others and helps them. So in Judaism, they had this sense that a righteous person is someone who both reflects the holiness of God, but also his grace and his love for others, his willingness to help those who are oppressed. When we come to the Gospels, we find a similar thing. And come on, uh, <clears throat> gentlemen at the back, if I wave at you, just move on the slide. And we find in the Gospels that... Uh, one of the first characters we meet is a righteous person. It is Joseph, the husband of Mary. And you'll know the story when he finds out that she is pregnant, he wants to put her away, and we are told that Joseph, being a righteous person, now we've got quite a few of my former students here from Newbold, so I put this in just to test whether they've been uh, keeping up with their Greek, Paul, and I hope you keep them on their toes with this, but it tells us that Joseph De Caius own, being righteous. He was a righteous person who honored the law. And so then 
You'd think he would just stick to the letter, but what does he do? He deals with charity to Mary, and he doesn't dismiss her. So there we have our first righteous person. We ourselves, as readers of the Gospels, are meant to be righteous persons. Blessed are those in the Beatitudes who hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. This should be part of our core identity as followers of Jesus. We should hunger and thirst for righteousness. So there we have a very, very brief introduction to what it means to be a righteous person. A righteous person is someone who hungers and thirsts for God's ways, for his laws. You're not expected to be perfect, sinless. They offer charity to those who are in trouble. And this is a tradition which is well embedded all the way through the Old Testament up until we come to the Gospel of Matthew. And when we come to the Gospel of Matthew, we find at certain points he talks about the righteous and the unrighteous. And he wants us to bring this Old Testament background to the text and to understand it in these terms. So there we have seen what a righteous person is. But I want to move on and ask the next question, what is the mission of a righteous person? What is the purpose of a righteous person? Let me go on one slide. Uh, what is the mission? One more. And um, here, I want us to look at a number of texts in Matthew. If you've got your Bibles, go to chapter 10. And Jesus there, he makes an allusion to an Old Testament story. And uh, when you, Jesus makes an allusion to an Old Testament story, he doesn't tell the whole story in its entirety. He just mentions a word, and he wants you to bring, rather like we know our stories from Sabbath school, from when we were little nippers, he wants us to bring that story to the table and to interpret his words in light of what we already know. So here we have, in chapter 10, an allusion in verse 15 to a certain Old Testament story. Truly I tell you, he says, and he's talking about those cities in Jerusalem who reject his disciples. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. What story does Jesus want us to remember? The story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he refers to this not just once, but if we go to chapter 11 in Matthew, we find another reference. Chapter 11, uh, let's, there we go. Chapter 11, and we have in verse 22 another reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So Jesus is comparing his cities in Galilee with Sodom and Gomorrah. And he wants us to bring that story into the picture and think, well, how do these cities that he's working in, in his own ministry, compare with Sodom and Gomorrah? We have another illusion. If we go to chapter 24... Next slide. Chapter 24, uh, or oh, one, one back, please. Uh, and there, in verse 16, Jesus is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem, and he alludes to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And maybe you can see the illusion yourself. Verse 15, so when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as was spoken by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must do what? What does he tell us to do? Flee to the mountains. Now, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, who fled to the mountains? Lot. He fled with his family to the mountains. Now, what was he told not to do? Look back. And this is what Jesus tells us here in Matthew 24. Verse 17, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one in, on the housetop must not go down to take what is in the house. The one in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. 
because you're righteous persons and you don't want to break the Sabbath. So there we have another allusion to Sodom and Gomorrah, to the Sodom story. And that the question is, how does being a righteous person relate to the Sodom story? Well, I'm going to paraphrase. If you know Genesis 18, you'll know the story of Abraham. He's sitting out under the tree, and he sees three men come, and he tells Sarah, quick, go and fetch, cook some food. She goes and bakes some bread. They kill a calf. They prepare this meal. <clears throat> It'll come shortly, don't worry. And, uh, and then uh, presents this food to the three. He offers them hospitality. He feeds the hungry. And then they, one of them tells Abraham, your wife, although she's very old, she's going to give birth. And you remember what her reaction was? She laughed, impossible. And uh, the, the person, which we would say is Jesus, says, no, 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 this thing is going to become reality. And then the person, which we would say is Jesus, he, he thinks, hmm, I promised to Abraham that he would become the father of a righteous people. Should I hide from him what I'm about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? Because I've heard the cry about their state. No, I'm going to tell him what I'm going to do. And if we go on one slide, we actually see what the Lord says to Abraham. He says, I'm going to go down and I'm going to deal with them. And Abraham's reaction was this. How on earth can you do that, Lord? Don't you know that in Sodom, now what do we know Sodom for? Sin, wickedness. Now, don't you know, and you know, we take our hat off to Abraham, he, he's an optimist. He says, don't you know, Lord, that in Sodom there are righteous persons? How can a righteous God destroy the righteous with the wicked? And the Lord, he thinks, well, how can I do that? And Abraham, he pushes forward and he says, uh, and it's a lovely story. He, mm, maybe I could be so brave, Lord, as to suggest that if there's just 50 righteous persons in Sodom, that you hold off from destroying Sodom. 50 righteous persons, would you give it a break? And what's the Lord's response? Yes. Okay, for 50. And then Abraham, he gets a little braver. Well, Lord, if, if I might be, I know it's a little impolite to bargain with you. What about 45? And then you know the story, how he goes down to 30, down to 20, until he goes down to 10. If there are just 10 righteous persons in Sodom, would you destroy it? And what's the Lord's response? If there are just 10 righteous persons in Sodom, I won't destroy it. And there we have the principle. How many do you need? How many righteous persons do you need to save Sodom? A hundred? Four hundred? Eight hundred? Four thousand? How many righteous persons do we need to save Sodom? Ten. Small groups matter. Even ten righteous persons can save Sodom. And this is the principle. The principle is, is that the righteous persons need to go out and mix in the community. And Jesus sends his disciples out to mix in the community, to be the righteous, to be the salt of the earth. What does salt do to food? It preserves it. They are to go out, and this is my message to you, is that your presence counts. Your presence in the community Counts regardless of number. It's important that we get out and mix in the towns and cities and villages of Scotland. It is important because we are the righteous uh, as a, a church called to holiness. We are there not to be righteous for ourselves in order to work our way to heaven. No, 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 that's not how it works. But we are to be holy. Why? Because we can save our communities from divine judgment. Your presence counts. You know, so many times I get up and just think, Lord, how many of us are there? And then I think, no, it's not the numbers that counts. It's the fact that I am a righteous person. And 
when I am in this community, it makes a difference to this community. God looks at this community, and instead of just giving up on the community, he says, there is one of my daughters. There is one of my sons. I am going to give them a break. I am going to give them a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. Why? Because one of my righteous persons dwells there. Your presence counts. Your presence in your communities is important from God's point of view. Small numbers, average churches, vitally important. Can we save the city? Yes, with just 10. And if you read Jewish traditions, they argue that not just 10, but they work down to even just one can save a community in God's eyes. So this is the, raises the question, well, how on earth can we go out and witness and and make our presence felt. How can we increase the number of righteous persons in our communities? And he gives us two ways. We have the first is that we simply do what we do when we go to the shops. Now, when we go to the shops, most things in the shops these days are made in where? China. Yeah. And uh, this is the, the, the easy way. If you want righteous persons in your community, you import them from outside. And this is what Jesus did in Matthew 10. He said to his disciples, go nowhere but the cities of Galilee. Don't want you to go to the Gentiles yet. That's our job. Go nowhere but the cities of Galilee and mix in the towns and cities. And go and knock on their doors and ask them, would you mind if I stay here for the night? Hmm. Now, there's the first way. We can increase the number of righteous persons in our towns and cities. We simply go out and we move there. Now, how many of you here have not been born in Scotland? You see, you're the first type. You're the type, you're, you're the made in China type righteous person, okay? <laughs> the made in China type who've come in to save Scotland. Praise God for you. You have a vital task. We've imported you from near and far, yeah, and even further than far, we've imported you into Scotland to save Scotland, to be the righteous persons. And, you know, I always feel a bit guilty. I mean, Jesus, he's very blunt. He's, he's equating the cities of Galilee to Sodom. And I don't really want to equate Scotland with Sodom, but can we play that game for a while? Yeah, Scotland is Sodom for at least the next five minutes. Uh, so he's imported you in to modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah in order that Sodom may be saved. But there's another way in which we can increase the number of righteous persons in our cities. And it's this. Uh, in chapter 10, he sends out his disciples. He doesn't say, guys, I want you to sit down and have a committee, raise money, Get your budget sorted, and once you've got enough money, launch off into evangelism. That's really the opposite of what he does. Uh, and um, uh, Earl here, who I've known for many years, he's a treasurer, he'll be thrilled to know that I've come up with a cost-free form of evangelism, Earl. Yes? This costs nothing. In, in fact, what it does, it requires you to put your money aside and just leave it. And in fact, the less money you have, the better. Wow. You've never heard that one before, have you? Uh, the pastors are probably scratching their head thinking, what am I going to share with the churches? But there is a form of evangelism where the less money you have, the less, the better it is. And notice this in chapter 10, verse 9. Uh, there we have, uh, let me move on. Jesus says this in verse... Um, in verse 9, or let's read from verse 8. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold. So how much money do the disciples need as they go out on their evangelistic activities? How much? None. Take no gold. No silver. How much silver? Zero. No copper in your belts. Not even a pound coin. It says take nothing. No bag on your journey or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. He's saying, don't even take a sleeping bag. Don't even take a mattress to sleep out under the stars. He's saying, go with nothing. And when you go out into the cities of Galilee, who is going to look after you? The 
the villagers are going to open their doors to you. And when they open their doors to you, hang on, how many clothes have you got? Not many. How much money have you got for food? None. So what's your stomach doing at that point? Rumbling. You are the hungry. You are the thirsty. You are those with just one set of clothes on your back and none others. You are to go out in weakness rather than in strength into your communities. Traditionally, we think of evangelism as like a war campaign where we build up the sizes of our army and we get the message right, we've got everything sorted and then we launch out into the community. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's not the way it goes. The least you have, the less you have, the better. I want you to take it off and just go with nothing because then you come to the community and you say, please, I need your help. And if the community opens their doors and feeds the hungry, who are the hungry here? Us. Who are the naked? Well, we're not quite naked at this point. Us. The thirsty. The homeless. We become that. And when they feed us and look after us, what does that make them? Into righteous persons. Remember Ezekiel 18, the righteous person does what to the hungry? Feeds the hungry. What does he do to the naked? Clothes the naked. It's almost as if the less we have, the better. We go out, and when the community opens its doors to us, they themselves are acting as righteous persons. And when God sees a city with these multiplying righteous persons all the way through it, what's he going to do to that, right, to that city? Is he going to judge it and smash it and obliterate it with judgment? No. He's going to give it a second chance. And he's going to hope that maybe this city can move further and we can get disciples who love me and who want to learn from me. And maybe we'll get some prophets there and wise men and scribes and all these other uh, ident disciple shop identities you get in the Gospel of Ma Matthew. And maybe the city as a whole will turn to me and acknowledge me as their king because ultimately that's what the Gospel is, the proclamation that Jesus is king over this earth. Well, <clears throat> Paul, I have five more minutes. Reality is, however, that when we go out, yes, our presence counts. Yes, our holiness counts. How many doors in reality open to us in our cities? It's not every door, is it? Jesus himself came to his own home. And what was their response? They rejected him. If you read in the Gospel of Matthew, you find that Jesus is a righteous person. Yeah, he came to his own town. If I can just click back one. Can we just go back one slide? Uh, and his death is portrayed as the death of a righteous person. Uh, Judas... What have I done? I have betrayed innocent blood. Innocent blood and righteous blood are essentially the same thing. Theologically, they function as the same. He takes the money, his blood money, and he throws it down at the feet of the priests. What have I done? I've betrayed innocent blood, righteous blood. And then you'll remember Pilate's wife can't sleep that night. She has a dream and a message comes to her and she gives the message to her husband. Do you remember what the message was? Have nothing to do with this man. Just leave him alone. Why? What type of man is he? He's a righteous person. Don't touch him. And then we have Pilate at the trial. He washes his hands and he declares, I am innocent of this blood. I am not going to shed this blood. It's not me who's doing this. We have a consistent theme throughout the crucifixion narrative of, G of Matthew that Jesus is a righteous person. And there's many other explanations for his death, but we don't have time for those. But he is a righteous person who is killed, a travesty of justice. And then he pushes it further. He says that it's not just 
Matthew says it's not just Jesus who dies the death of a righteous person, but it's his followers who die the death of righteous persons. If you go with me to Matthew 23, we have two verses I want to read there for you. Matthew 23, verse 34, he says this, and he's talking to the leaders of Israel, the leaders of Jerusalem, the leaders of the city. He says, therefore, I send to you his his own prophets, my prophets, my wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some of whom you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town, so that, and when you hear the word so that, you know this is the purpose, why Jesus is sending his followers out into the towns and cities, into Jerusalem, so that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of Ze righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. What is Jesus saying here? He's essentially saying, I'm sending out my followers, my righteous followers with their righteous blood into the community. And how is the community likely to respond? Some may open their doors, but what are others going to do? They're going to persecute you. In fact, it may even get to the point that they shed your blood. But here is the thing. Your blood, when it is shed, it counts. It cries out. And he, tells, he alludes to two stories. Whose blood is crying out? Abel. Where do we find the story of Abel in Scripture? Genesis. So he says the blood from the first book of the Old Testament is crying out, Abraham, A Abel killed by Cain, is crying out from the ground, Lord, when will I get justice? And then Zechariah, son of Berechiah, not one of the most well-known characters in the Old Testament, but why is Jesus alluding to Zechariah? Why? Because when you read your Old Testament, not in the order that we have in our Bibles, what's the last book of the Old Testament in our Bibles? Malachi. But if you read in the Hebrew Bible order, as a Jew would have, the last book in the Old Testament is not Malachi, that's essentially the Greek translation order. The last book is Second Chronicles. And Second Chronicles 24 has the story of Jehoiada, who was the high priest, witnessing to Joash, good King Joash, but Jehoiada dies, and then bad leaders come and they convince the king to turn away from the Lord, and Zechariah, he stands up and he says, no, this city must turn back to the Lord. Do not abandon him. And they rise up and they kill him in the temple. And we have traditions in the time of Jesus where you could actually go into the temple, and they said there was a red spot on the ground in the temple, you read this in Josephus, where it, the, there was blood bubbling. I mean, you know, hard for us to imagine today. But this was a tradition. Zechariah's blood still bubbles in the temple, crying out for justice. And Jesus is saying, my righteous followers are going to go out. And what's going to happen is, is that when they give their lives for me, it's not wasted blood. The effort of being Christian of being countercultural, of living in a culture which despises the name of Jesus. It's a hard way to live. But he's saying, not just that your holiness counts, not just that your presence counts, but that your suffering counts. Your blood bubbles crying out for justice. And this blood, a symptom, a, a symbol of how the community has turned against you, comes to the ears of the Lord and he hears this and one day he says judgment will be enacted and in Matthew judgment is simply where you get pure justice mercy runs out and Jesus treats the cities as they have treated his followers this is the theology of the gospel of Matthew is that we are called to be righteous persons we are called to love holiness. We as Adventists, above all Christian groups, shouldn't we be the ones who emphasize holiness? Of everyone 
in the Christian world. We are the ones who've lifted up God's ways. And we should be a community who loves holiness, not just in terms of loving his law, but also reaching out to those in trouble. But then he asks us to go out, not with wealth, not with resources, the less the better, and see how they respond to you. And maybe we can increase the number of righteous persons, not just in Sodom, not just in the cities of Galilee, but in Scotland. Our presence counts. I would like you this morning to leave here convinced that it's not the numbers that make a difference, but it's the fact that there are wheat in the field which protect the tares from judgment. That we are to be, we are unique. Scotland is a great country because of you. Scotland survives and hasn't been judged by God because of who? Because of you. You are the wheat that preserves the tares from judgment. And I want you to go convinced of the importance of this world, this work. May we. Hold on to holiness, saints. May we be brave enough to mix with our communities. And when and if they respond with hostility, may we know that the Lord counts every response and one day there will be judgment and justice. But let us be faithful in our mission to be a presence in our towns and in our cities. Your presence counts. This is my message to the glory of God this morning. Amen.